Exodus chapter 33, I'd like to read, it would be a lengthy scripture reading if I'd read what I'd like to read to us, but I think I will drop down to verse 12, Exodus chapter 33, and verse 12. And uh, I read something in one of the letters that, uh, the, um, that came from the, a couple of years ago, I think, from the uh, connectional office, and uh, I got a little under conviction. I read my scripture reading rather quickly, maybe too quickly sometimes. I'll try to slow down. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast not also found grace in, thy, in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and I will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank thee tonight that we are able to call upon thy matchless name, the name that's above every name, the name at uh, which every knee shall bow one day and confess that thou art God, thou art Lord. And our Father, we look to thee tonight and we pray in the precious name of Jesus that the blessed Holy Ghost, the third person of the Trinity, would somehow grace this platform and our God would grace the entire service and our Father that we would sense and know that we have not heard man but we've been hearing from heaven that we've heard through the blessed Holy Ghost. Our God, would thou have thy way would thou come and keep coming and keep moving and keep stirring our hearts and Lord help that we might say something we might somehow get the burden that we felt that thou didst place on our heart out on the hearts of this people and Lord help some soul tonight that may be outside of the fold someone that's unsaved someone that may be a backslider someone oh God that's not really gone on to holiness Oh, God, that they would seek thee tonight. They would humble themselves. They would bow at this altar. And they would call on God. All this accomplished. Thou shalt be praised. Thou shalt have the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> now, when I first learned about this, in fact, before I actually did read the letter uh, that had come to our address, um, it, uh, I, it wasn't immediate, but within a few hours, I felt that this was the line of truth that the Lord would have us to bring. And I told Brother Benninger that uh, I uh, appreciated his message, but I kind of envied his slot that he had. He had the first uh, in the uh, uh, session. So, uh, uh, but anyway, three nights ago, I felt like I had this on the front burner, uh, and I've been kind of putting it to the back burner and then bring it to the front burner, if you know what I mean, uh, for these weeks now, for about three weeks, and, and I hope some way, and I've changed the ingredient just a little bit, added a little more, uh, and so on. I hope and pray that it will uh, come out uh, uh, tonight for God's glory, and that somebody will receive definite help 
I'd like to speak to us tonight on show me thy glory. The text in the 18th verse, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And in verse 13, we read, show me now thy way. Well, once we know the way that God is directing and God is leading for our salvation, uh, thank God, then we need to uh, pray and beseech him as Moses did to show me thy glory. Well, this term glory is very conspicuous in the Bible. The glory of the Lord is mentioned 31 times. And the term as related to worship and Christian experience uh, is found at least 75 times. In 1 Samuel, we have a distressing statement as it relates to a sordid story. Um, Israel wanted a visible God. Um, they wanted to conform to and pattern after heathen nations around her. Uh, God uh, accommodated them by giving them the Ark of the Covenant. Um, and this Ark was a symbol of God, uh, an inclusive type of Christ. Um, a guide to Israel. It was, however, the downfall of heathenism. It seemed strange that this ark would be captured, would be stolen by uh, a heathen nation, but it was. Well, this is the story. Eli, an old and long entrusted priest, compromised with sin. He restrained not his vile sons, even allowing them to participate in the temple worship. The Bible says these sons knew not God. They were idol worshipers and they were so vile that they had no respect for the sacrifices and they were so wicked as to even seduce the women who would assemble at the tabernacle door. Eli actually honored his sons above God. He fleeced the people to, uh, to pad his bank account that he was soon to leave to his family. And like some today, sad to say, they may have a standard for themselves, but another or no standard for their families or for their congregations. I know whereof I speak. I asked, inquired just a few short years ago about somebody in another state that we had known of and said, to, oh, said, sorry to say, uh, the church is so uh, terribly worldly. Uh, but uh, said, uh, you know, as far as the pastor and his wife said, I believe they have a good standard. Uh, well, good. Uh, but I like to project mine a little bit. Uh, I don't know how you feel about it. Uh, but I believe uh, it's going to rub off and people are going to want to follow the way that we are endeavoring to lead them. Uh, praise the Lord. Uh, I believe uh, we will hold to the Bible standard, not to, uh, to somebody's notion. Well, God was so very displeased uh, with this that he pronounced judgment on Eli and on his house. Um, and judgment, once pronounced, falls fast uh, and it falls heavy. At Ebenezer, uh, Israel is locked in battle with the Philistines. Um, they had lost 4,000 footmen. Uh, in desperation, uh, they push the panic button. Now the elders uh, uh, send for the ark of God. Um, the vile and licentious sons of Eli accompanied the ark. Israel shouted that day, but God was not in their shout. That's right, it was merely a program, just a, a little worked up, a little enthusiasm. You know, sometimes a, a little bit of a pep talk or something and a little enthusiasm. I'm glad, thank God, there's something that goes deeper than that. And though their shout was empty, it did scare the Philistines. But it takes more than an empty shout to work up uh, or to whip up uh, a little enthusiasm in a dying church. In a desperate dare-to-die attitude, the Philistines now gear again for battle and 30,000 more Israeli soldiers are killed. And then follows a calamitous catastrophe. Eli, he's now 98 years old, blind and obese. That means uh, a little over heavy. And he trembles as he hears now the noise of battle in the distance. He fears for the safety of the ark of God. A runner brings a sobering report. Israel is defeated and the ark is captured and Eli's sons are killed. Well, uh, this report was too much for the old priest. He fell down backwards and was dead. They carry the news to the wife of one of his sons, Phinehas, uh, uh, who was great with child, and hearing the tragic news, uh, she gives birth to her baby boy. Um, her friends tell her, 
Fear not, thou hast born a son. She named him Ichabod, saying the glory is departed from Israel. But we would like to leave this, uh, uh, this dark picture of Israel's history tonight and consider the glory of God. The glory does not consist of ornate buildings, cushioned pews, pipe organs, degreed ministers, uh, and finery or polished uh, uh, philosophies. A southern preacher, in fact, said God can do more with fools on fire than he can with scholars on ice. And a hot, blundering man will do more, be more effective than a cold, correct man. Well, this is certainly not to put the ignorance uh, on, uh, a premium on ignorance, but it does put the emphasis on the essentials. Well, this glory is not found in superhuman abilities or ecclesiastical accomplishments. Neither is the glory related to social affairs or recreational activities, but to the mighty baptism of the blessed Holy Ghost. The term glory is taken from the word glow. It suggests to give a bright shining light, to be incandescent or red hot. I have heard back over the years uh, one or two young fellows say, bless God, I think I'm just a little too hot for them. Well, I haven't seen anybody that was too hot to, uh, for anybody yet. I'll be real honest with you. We need all of God that we can get, and I need all of God that I can get to and uh, I never go to a pulpit, whether before a congregation like this, I suppose uh, my knees ought to be knocking tonight. Uh, well, maybe they are a little bit. Uh, but uh, uh, I thank God, uh, I'll tell you, there's no place that I have found more real enjoyment and real, uh, real uh, uh, blessing upon my soul than when I was endeavoring to proclaim the message and when the Holy Ghost came and sanction the truth and bless and help people in the congregation. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, uh, this uh, word glory uh, is taken from the word glow. And uh, uh, it suggests uh, majesty, it suggests beauty, and it suggests blessing. This glory is observed in the radiance and in the splendor and effulgence of the divine presence. It is the Shekinah of the supernatural, the manifest presence of the eternal God. Praise God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob or Israel. Praise the Lord. And I don't know whether that touches your heartstrings or not, but thank God whenever a preacher comes over that or reads that, it blesses my soul to know that we can serve the same God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel and he's still the same tonight, praise the Lord. Well, it is the Shekinah of the supernatural. And while the term Shekinah itself is not used in the Bible, uh, the term was applied by ancient Jews uh, to the visible symbol of the divine presence. The Shekinah glory is related to the tabernacled presence of God. The term is from the Hebrew word shukan, meaning to reside to dwell or to abide with the abiding presence of God. Praise the Lord. And I like that. Hallelujah. That's what we need is the abiding presence of God, not a visitor or someone who just comes for a time, but one who abides. Praise the Lord. The two on the road to Emmaus, as you'll recall, and Jesus joined himself unto them. And there they were, and there, uh, they walked along the way and were so sad, trudging along, pulling one foot up after the other. And this one joined himself unto them, and uh, he said, why are you so sad? And they said, oh, are you but a stranger in these parts, and knowest not what has taken place, and beside all this, uh, this is the third day. Their eyes were holding. They didn't know to, uh, who was speaking uh, with them, or whom was speaking with them. Well, as he made as if he would go further, they got to their destination and turned in. But the Bible says they constrained him. Praise God. And we'll constrain him. Thank God he will abide with us. Amen. 
man. He won't come in accidentally. And he won't come to your heart or your church or your altar or your home accidentally. We're going to have to invite him and constrain him. Praise God. And he came in and their eyes still holding. But when he would look up and give thanks for the fish just caught at Gennesaret, I suppose, and then their eyes were opened, praise the Lord, and the Bible says they rose up the same hour. I'll tell you, my friend, when you get this Holy Ghost power upon your soul, uh, thank God you'll shake the dust off of your feet. Praise the Lord, you'll make your way. You'll want to tell somebody else about it. And they hurried back the seven and a half miles, and they hurried in, and they went in there, and they found their way to the upper room. The doors had been locked and so on and the windows closed and all of this for fear of the Jews but they admitted them and they were in there and what they were doing was talking about the encounter they had on the Emmaus road praise God and while they were talking Jesus appeared unto them praise the Lord oh hallelujah you know we'll take more time and talk more about Jesus why we'll have more of his presence in our midst praise the Lord hallelujah Amen. Thank God. Praise His name. Oh, hallelujah. Well, we read here in Exodus 28 and verse 8. He said, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And the glory, verse 16 of 24, And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai. Verse 17, And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire. And then Ezekiel 28 and 22 said, I will be glorified in the midst of thee, and they shall know that I am the Lord. And Haggai 1 and 8, go to the mountains and build the house, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Praise his name. Hallelujah. I like to ask, what is our real purpose of existing anyhow? What's our real purpose of building churches? What's our purpose of Sunday schools? And so on. Is it for numbers? Or are we getting over into the book of Acts? I think we need to get over there. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, the glory of the Lord was displayed in the fiery baptism with the Holy Ghost at Pentecost said St. Paul in 2 Corinthians 3, 7 through 9, if the administration of death, that is the giving of the law, was glorious, shall not the ministration of the Spirit be more glorious? Well, in the giving of the law, there was thunder, lightning, and a thick cloud, the voice of a trumpet exceeding loud, and the Lord descended in a fire and uh, uh, to, to bring condemnation, law, and judgment. But at Pentecost, the Holy Ghost came accompanied with the unusual phenomenon, the sound of mighty rushing wind, tongues of fire, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Praise His name. Pentecost brought blessing. It brought light. It brought illumination. It brought purity. Pentecost brought grace. And it brought mercy. Praise the Lord. Well, this glory is manifest in true spiritual piety, in the spirit of liberty and freedom of the saints. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I saw a lady in Camp Gilead, Ohio, a few years ago uh, that came to be sanctified. And uh, I remember as she and God was moving on many hearts there it seemed. And after a while she got victory. Praise the Lord. And the Holy Ghost came in filling the vessel. And she, I remember, went across the front of that tabernacle there. And one shoe fell off, but that didn't even deter her or stop her. She never bothered with it. She just kept on praising God. Hallelujah. And the glory came. The glory fell. Praise the Lord. I'll tell you, thank God, my friend, there's something about it. When the Holy Ghost come, when He is come, praise the Lord. I'll tell you, He supersedes all the human effort, ever, all the programming, and everything else. One thing I've appreciated about this conference, that we have just been in there were at least a few times when the Holy Ghost, somebody said, well, the Lord breaking in upon us. Well, uh, thank God He came upon us. He came in our midst and he continued to come and to come and to come. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I don't know what you want, but that's what I want. Praise his name. Hallelujah. If we can just have him, his presence, the glory of the Lord. Oh, thank God. Well, we see the glory in warm-hearted sacred music and song, in joyous, victorious praise of the saints. 
This glory is also seen in the spirit and power of prayer. Amen. I'll tell you, well, friend, there have been a few times when God laid such a burden in my heart I didn't know how I was going to carry it. Uh, and uh, uh, But what a privilege it is uh, to feel by times at least that you have uh, been at least bordering on being an intercessor. Hallelujah. Oh, thank God. What a privilege it is to just have a part in the salvation of souls. Well, this glory is, is also seen in the spirit uh, and uh, uh, in spirit anointed preaching of God's word. The unction of the spirit is not an ecclesiastical exercise or dramatics. Now we all have to, uh, we're, we're just, uh, uh, just what we are. If we're minding God, we ought to just be what the Lord uh, would have us to be and not try to imitate anybody but Jesus. Uh, but uh, uh, my friends, there's a certain amount, I suppose, that we do to try to uh, get our words out. Uh, I don't know what some of us would do if we t- they tied our hands behind our back uh, to try to talk or communicate. But anyway, uh, well, we all have a little different way maybe of getting it out. Uh, but thank God, my friend, uh, uh, when, uh, uh, when the Spirit uh, of the living God is moving on the heart of the minister, uh, uh, anointing and doing him with a divine anointing until he literally, I believe, becomes the mouthpiece of the Holy Ghost, at least for times. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. What a challenge. What a tremendous responsibility we have. A charge to keep we have and a God to glorify. Never dying souls to save and fit them for the skies. They sang that at my ordination. In fact, uh, it was just uh, 30 years ago, uh, uh, the 14th of the next month, July, uh, that uh, I was ordained uh, to the ministry up in Ontario, Canada. In fact, 1952 was a pretty good year uh, for me. Uh, uh, We uh, uh, were ordained uh, that year, uh, dedicated a new uh, church uh, that year uh, that we had started uh, uh, in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. uh, And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, uh, my wife and I were married that year. So if you want to send us an anniversary card, uh, the end of June, uh, why uh, 30th of June was the date. I, <clears throat> I won't expect it, but <laughs> anyway, that's when it was. Well, the glory is seen in restoration of backsliders, conversion of sinners, the sanctification of believers, as well as divine healing of the body. Praise His name. We see this glory in the plenteousness of divine grace. Afflictions may come, oppositions arise, reverses, assail, and even death. But the glory still lingers, adequate for overcoming victory. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I read of a fellow, uh, an evangelist, a preacher, that uh, years ago got off of the train. His house had burned. I don't know if some of his family had perished in the flames or not. It seemed to me that they had. Uh, but he was left alone. And uh, someone said to him, as they took him to the uh, burned out site, uh, and said, uh, you've lost everything. He said, no, not everything. He said, I still have Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, this glory is seen in the sweetness of a divine presence, the abundance of divine mercy, and the majesty of divine power. Praise the Lord. But as great and glorious as this glory is, it may be lost. I don't know what time I started, so I don't know what time I'll get finished. It's sad but true that Israel lost the Shekinah presence of Almighty God. She was miserably defeated and carried into Babylon in captivity. Having lost the tabernacle presence of God, they lost their happy songs of personal joy and victory. Discouraged, defeated, bemoaning their fate, they hang their harps on the willows. Her captors haunt her with, sing us one of the songs of Zion. But she said, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? And let me ask you, my friend, How can you sing the Lord's song if you're not minding God? How can you really make it ring true, my friend, if you're dilly-dallying out there on the fringes, uh, borderline, or going out, and eventually you'll be led away and astray completely from God? 
an accurate appraisal of this, uh, of the present day church will certainly convince, I think, the candid mind that many a denomination uh, and many a local church and, and if not individuals uh, have lost the glory. Lost the glory. I don't stand tonight with the idea that nobody has victory but uh, just a few of us. But uh, my friends, I think we would have to all admit we need more and more and more of God. To remedy the situation of lost glory, we need to learn the contributing factors and what must be done to regain and recapture the lost glory. First of all, the substitution of orthodoxy for spirituality. Now, doctrine uh, is of little value unless applied to Christian living. Theoretical religion, regardless of how doctrinally sound, is worthless in getting the glory on the people and on the soul. There are three major steps in ecclesiastical backsliding. First of all, backsliding from a vital Christian experience where love, peace, and happiness are no longer realities, and prayer no longer touches God for spiritual blessings. Secondly, forfeit a Bible standard of holy living and separation from the world. And third, and a backslide from doctrinal position. Well, the first two steps may have taken place and the church or the individual may long hold to the doctrine. They may have it in their book. They may still mouth it, but eventually that goes also. Sad to say, but in too many holiness circles, there are those who are have changed or are changing their position regarding death uh, to sin and eradication of the carnal nature and the possibility of living above sin in this life. Sad to say, but there are people uh, who are drifting in that direction. Second substitution of programs, plans, and projects for the moving, melting of the divine spirit. Substitution of ecclesiastical manipulation, human enthusiasm for the mighty moving of God's Holy Spirit is a sad thing and the glory fades and as the glory fades organizational activities are usually increased Amen. that's right when we lose out on the inside we usually try to fix up on the outside Amen. now that doesn't mean we never will uh, chink up the cracks on the outside wall or paint the uh, the unpainted boards or, the, or, or take care of the building but my friends so often uh, we try to make up for what's lost on the inside for what to, by putting something on the outside and then substitution of socials and recreational activities for the spirit of evangelism evangelism once the glory of the church is now supplanted in some places with cookouts with carry-ins with uh, with festivals with parties and uh, fun frolics and you name it amen You'll be surprised. Well, how can we hold our young people? Well, bless God, get the Lord on you. And praise the Lord. I'll tell you, there's nobody that's going to respond any quicker uh, than or more quickly uh, than a young person that senses the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. In fact, I might as well be real honest with you. We gather a few illustrations up and down the country. Uh, I don't know whether we've gotten any here yet or not. I haven't tabulated them. But anyway, uh, uh, there are those, uh, uh, you know, that we have discovered. It's harder to get some of the old folk to line up uh, than it is some of the young folk. I remember one place we inherited a situation uh, in another uh, group, of course. We haven't pastored any Allegheny churches. Uh, uh, but uh, I could not get that secretary of that church, that official board, uh, to uh, her shirt, uh, her, her uh, uh, dress sleeves to uh, come down below the elbow to cover the bony, uh, fleshy arm and elbow. I just couldn't get the, uh, it done, uh, no matter how I preached or how I went at it or anything else. Um, they just wouldn't grow. I guess it must have been dead. Well, the deadness was in the heart. I'm, I'm sure of that. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I guess you know what side I'm on, don't you? I'm on the Lord's side. Amen. Praise the Lord. In fact, I might as well tell you this. 
Uh, tonight, you wouldn't give a lick for anything I'd try to say if I didn't have a testimony. But I'll say this. If I, if I didn't want any more than some folk around, some holiness churches are seemingly trying to satisfy themselves with, I might as well stay back in that dead United Church of Canada where I was. Uh, but I'm not interested in going that way. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, today they have their clubs, their banquets, their retreats, and call the ministries of the church. Uh, so often, uh, the one who is most lifeless in the worship service, if they're in the wor worship service, uh, is the one who excels at the social activities. One place where we were, uh, why uh, uh, we happen to be there when they're having their Sunday school picnic. And I groan when I hear a little about that. But you know, uh, you can go on a Sunday school picnic, I suppose, and have the Lord with you. At least I did. And... Uh, but I said to the pastor, I said, who's that over there? Why, she was in the midst of the potato salad and the sandwiches and uh, chattering and laughing and, and you name it. And she was there. I mean, she was, looked like she was about everywhere at the same time. I said, who is that lady? Oh, that so-and-so said she hadn't come to the revival much. I said, no, I've never seen her. You'd be surprised how many people there are. You know, it's easier to kind of uh, chomp on sandwiches and potato salads and, and kind of laugh and joke than it is to pray and, uh, uh, and mind God, isn't it? Amen. Well, we're all here that are here. I might as well tell you, I, when I saw all the campers that were pulling out, I, I was kind of almost clapping my hands. I thought, we won't maybe have a service. I won't maybe need to try to preach. And then when the thunder clouds came up and the thunder was rolling, why, I thought maybe I, maybe it'll be called off. And my wife said when we're coming over, well, maybe somebody get blessed. And they won't need to. Well, I tried to help out. I was getting blessed anyhow. But uh, anyway, here we are. And I haven't been vaccinated with a phonograph needle either. But I thought, well, it's about like a changing of the guard. You know, just about like changing of the guard. Because so many left, but then some others came in. We're glad you're here. I hope you're glad you're here. Well, the publicized calendar of events for the youth society of one church for the summer months read like this in one place. June 27, horseback riding, bring $2. July 6, Saturday overnight camping, $15. July 13, put-put golf, bring $2. July 20, leave for camp immediately after school. July 27, trip to Kings Island, leave at 9 a.m. I don't know where that is. August 3, midsummer party, games, food, fun. That's what folk are looking for, food and fun. Amen. Yeah. And August 17, bake sale. You know, I had a lady in, up in Ontario. I pastored, uh, was it three years, I guess, before my wife and I married uh, or met. Uh, and uh, anyway, this lady from the old formal church, uh, was coming to our services, and uh, but she was still going to the ladies' aid meeting up at the Stone Church um, in that little town of Bruce Mines. And one hot July day, we were to be there, and the district superintendent of the area was to be there, and we were there for the evening meal and um, for the service that night. And <clears throat> she was tell started telling us, uh, uh, she said, you know, I was to go up uh, here to the old church, she said, and take up a couple of pies and a cake or two, and she said... Uh, I, it was so hot, and she said, I just began, I turned the oven on, and she said, I began to think about it, and she said, I came in here in the cool living room, and she said, I sat down and began to laugh and uh, think of what a foolish person I was. She said, I went out there and turned off the burner, and she said, I thought, I'm not going to take a, bake a cake or a pie and take it up there. I'm going to go up there with an offering. And she said, I know they expect me to buy some and bring them home, take mine up uh, for sale and bring, buy somebody else and bring them home. And she began to laugh about it. And she laughed when she told us. Uh, she said, I'm just going to take them an offering. And she said, I haven't baked one for them since. Well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, the closest some folk get to the fire is to the kitchen stove, I'm afraid. Well, I thank God that we can have some fire in the pew and in the pulpit. Praise the Lord. And by the way, my friend, when we have a little more fire in the pew, we'll have a little more of it in the pulpit. Praise the Lord. Of course, we expect to have it in the pulpit anyhow, uh, but it's easier to kindle a fire from the pulpit when we have it in the pew. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I thought you'd shout a little more than you're doing. <laughs> August 24, uh, bowling, 55 cents a game. Whoopee. 
And there will be no meetings for the youth during the summer months. But they did remind the church, it must have been a weak one, of the midweek prayer meeting. Some time ago, they announced scheduled zone meetings for a certain area. Five out of eight zones held their meetings at restaurants. Well, it used to be that the church charted her course uh, uh, from the upper room and not the supper room. Some meetings may sometimes be held in restaurants, I suppose, but I don't think we'll be selecting those that have the lounges adjoining. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Have you ever heard of anybody really in a grips and intercessor prayer in a Holiday Inn? Or a Howard Johnson's? I never have. In fact, once in a while, if you watch closely, you might see in some restaurant somebody bow their head and thank God for the food. Otherwise, some of them will even eat with their caps on. Well, I'm trying to say that we need to get back to the prayer room. There's a lady who wrote to us after we'd been in meetings in Ontario in another church. And uh, in fact, there was a distant relative by marriage of mine. And uh, she said, I'm the last one she wrote regarding a song and wondered where she could get a certain song. I wouldn't remember the song now. But anyway, she said, uh, uh, you know, she said, I may be the last one that should be saying this coming from uh, from the old modern church. But she said, you know... uh, She said, if we would go to all the social activities and fellowships and so on that our church has in one week, she said, we wouldn't be able to stay awake in our regular services on Sunday. I don't know why people think they have to teach other people how to fellowship one with the other as far as socializing is concerned. And then another substitution of standards and regulations for consistency and deep spirituality is another cause. I expect you know that we believe in modesty and plainness of dress. But if that is all we have and we don't have the glory, my friend, we just have a form and we don't have, we have law without grace and it's devoid of glory. There are those who will shout boisterously when uh, when you preach uh, on externals or uh, mention and talk and preach against TV, but they'll close up tighter than the clam when you preach about Christian consistency and paying your bills and paying your tithes. I said to a storekeeper one place where we were, he was always quipping about something, a store manager. I said, well, you know, I thought I'd meet him a little bit this one day. Nobody else seemed to be around there anyhow, and he wasn't very busy. I said, you know, I called him my name. I said, you know, you ought to treat us preachers a little extra good, a little better than others. And, uh, He said, how's that? I said, well, I said, of our church members and our people, parishioners, I said, if they get what we preach and bind the Lord, I said, they'll pay out their old grocery grocery bills. Oh, he said, I never thought of that. I said, well, I did. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I believe we'll either take care of the bill or we'll make arrangements to take care of it. Praise the Lord. We made it, so we'll dispense of it. Hallelujah. You're not getting too excited right now, but that's... um, That's the way I preach where I go. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, I heard of a father praying one time, and he was praying about widow so-and-so down the road. Oh, Lord, don't let her starve. You know, his little girl said after her daddy stopped praying, said, Daddy, why, you don't need to bother God with that. Said, well, you can take care of that. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, I'll tell you, being faithful and minding God, it goes deeper than honk if you love Jesus. Praise the Lord. I've seen some of those signs and I've seen somebody smoking a a stogie as I passed them by or saw them closer. Or they were painted up with barn paint on their lips or their face. Well, inconsistency is about like some couples that I've seen around some churches and some revivals and some camp meetings. And they're leaning over each other, and it looked like the honeydew was dripping off their fingertips and their elbows. Uh, But uh, uh, when they got hooked up in marriage, uh, it seemed to be all have leaked out. I might as well tell you, I don't just really go for all that kind of display in public. Amen. Amen. I've heard of too many that separated. Well, could that be the same couple that I 
uh, saw 40 years later, and the lonesome little lady slid over on the uh, seat there uh, as they were driving along uh, beside her husband, and but her husband said, Now, honey, I told you 40 years ago I loved you, and if there's any change, uh, I'll let you know. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I don't know whether we got any... Uh, horse and buggy drivers here or not, but I've seen a few in the past when uh, they'd kink the buggy wheels around to let the uh, queen, you know, step in. Your queen, you hope to be. But after a while, they said, hurry up, can't you get in any quicker than that? <laughs> Consistency. Yes, come on. Hey Amen. You want to go on with the rest of it? Well, we see the loss of glory in emptiness. I'm not paid by the hour anyway, so I'll keep on a little bit. We see the loss of glory in emptiness of Christian profession. Well, this shows up in the form of deadness in the worship service. Vagueness of personal testimony. Amen. How many people have you, or how many times have you stood up in the past and said, Well, I'm glad for what the Lord can do. Well, I'd like to hear what He's done for you. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, it's one thing to sing, Oh, happy day that fixed my choice, but it's another thing to be able to sing, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine right now. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Well, we see the loss of glory in the lack of loyalty, selfishness of spirit, prayerlessness, loss of hunger for God's word, lack of holy enthusiasm, and the stranglehold the secular world seemingly has gotten on to some preachers and some lay people. We ask, where is the dedication to the cause of Christ? I have known of some laymen and some preachers, uh, too, uh, who claim to be strict and straight and radical, uh, but try to pull them away from their secular job or their little nest. They won't even accept a pastorate that inconveniences some people. Amen. Praise the Lord. One thing I can say about it, I got it settled before we left the parsonage, whether I was going to worry about what people thought or whether we got calls or, or this, that, or the other. Praise the Lord. And whether we got enough to keep us in the field or not, I got it settled. As long as the, uh, the needs were supplied and the bills were paid, we would continue on as long as God was leading. And thank God He's still leading. I feel His thumb in my back at this very moment. Well, some folk are not faithful to their own church. Uh, they want all the awards and Christmas treats, and, and if you'll make a little more over them than they make over them at their home church, why, you'll be, you can be sure that they're going to be there on Rally Day or Easter or whenever it is. But don't expect them to support with their prayers, with their presence, and with their purse. After all, they can always go home to the home church. Now, maybe they can, but you're not being consistent, not being faithful. And I'll have to confess that there have been some with whom we have labored in the ministry that I wondered if they had forgotten what some old timers had gone through or were willing to go through and to do without complaining and put up with just to be in the will of God and in His work. Amen. Well, the prophet's complaint against Israel was they lived in palatial homes or houses and said it is not time to build God's house. Well, we see the loss of glory in the substitution of social togetherness for fellowship with the Spirit. Do you suppose that some holiness professors really know the difference between social togetherness and fellowship with the Spirit? I remember one place we were, sometimes we wonder how we get called in some places. But uh, we were in this one place just a few years ago in another state out in the Midwest somewhere. And uh, for another group... Uh, that aren't known to be very spiritual as far as that's concerned, heavy on the social line. And they said, come over to the uh, fellowship building, said, uh, we're going to have an afterglow. Well, about all I saw was afterglow, a steaming coffee and, uh, and uh, uh, Frosties or whatever they had. That's about all I saw. And I'll tell you, my spirit was grieved. I've been glad to have had a good prayer meeting. Praise the Lord. What fellowship can we have with somebody like that? I've been, when we pastored, I've been members of secretary in an instance or two of the ministerial group, but some places I refused. 
Sometimes you can help and sometimes you cannot help very much. I think we'll want to take our stand, but there isn't much fellowship if their heart is not as your heart and if their purpose is not as your purpose. Someone said it's a very sad day when churches began naming their auxiliary buildings fellowship halls. Consciously or unconsciously, it can give the impression that their greatest fellowship that they enjoy is not in the worship service where we sing the songs of Zion, where we pray the glory down, and where people testify and where the Word of God is preached. That's where I find the greatest fellowship. How about you? Or can you hardly wait till the service is over? And oh my, wasn't he such a long-winded fellow? Kind of reminds me of one place we were in another state, and I wasn't holy and I hadn't preached long. It was the last night of the revival, and God had blessed and given us a few souls at the altar in that little mission church that it was then. I understand having a nice building now, but anyway, it was about 10 o'clock, and I told you I hadn't preached that long by any means. If I had preached 50 minutes that night, I think that was about the limit that night. But anyway, God had blessed, and God was giving some victories, and... The pastor, after testimony, she said, Well, is there anything else in anybody's heart? And a lady went back near the back, near the door, said, Well, I, all I know is my sandwiches are getting cold. I want to go home. Well, I don't know how many people we have. I don't know whether she had, as they say, a few bricks uh, less than a full load or not. But anyway, uh, uh, be that as it may, I don't reflect on anybody's intelligence at all because I don't know if mine's real high either. But... Uh, Anyway, I thank God for what I'm lacking. The Lord seemed to help me with. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank God. Well, Christian fellowship is based on likeness of nature rather than likeness of interest. It centers in Christ. When people and families lose interest in family devotions, prayer meetings, revival, they are inclined to fill the vacancy with human appreciations and reunions and clubs and even lodges. You'd be surprised the people who have gone from Holiness churches and gone and joined lodges out there in clubs and so on. The prophet asked Israel, Isaiah 10 and 3, To whom will you flee for help and where will you leave your glory? He was no doubt referring to their assets, but where have we left and lost our glory? King Saul put his glory in uh, political favor and fat cattle, Samson in illicit relationship Achan in a heathen garment and a wedge of gold and a bit of silver, Ananias and Sapphira in an inflated profession, and a lie, Demas in worldly alliance. But where did we lose our glory? Would you admit tonight that you need more of the glory of God? I would. Would you admit that your church needs more of the glory of God without being critical? I would. Amen. We need the glory of God upon us. We need more of His glory. Some have lost their glory uh, when assailed by the devil's fiery darts or discouragement or when they gave in to ungodly relatives. Others lost theirs when they flared up in a board meeting and, and, uh, and uh, could not have their own way or when on vacation uh, they let the bars down in their devotions or in their appearance, in their dress. Um, or in worldly amusements. Amen. Amen. Where did you lose your glory if you've lost it? Amen. Amen. May the Lord help us. Israel was victorious as long as she had the glory of God. As long as Israel had the glory, no natural barrier could impede her progress. She went out of Egypt to cross the Red Sea, marched through the Jordan River, and went on to possess her possessions and receive her inheritance. The glory was on her and all about her, and the people trembled about her. Praise God. Hallelujah. As long as Israel had the glory, no privation could alter her course of faith. Manna came from heaven, water from the rock, and quail from the sky. Satan could not starve her. Praise the Lord. Her necessities were supernatural supplied. As long as Israel had the glory, no opposition was strong enough to defeat her purpose. She buried the Egyptians in the depths of the sea, shouted down the walls of Jericho, liquidated the giants in Canaan, and went on to possess the land of promise. Praise the Lord. But when Israel sinned, she lost her power with God and her influence with man. He, the nations, no longer respected and revered her. 
but repeatedly oppressed and carried her into captivity as slaves. My friends, you're a slave tonight either of sin and Satan or you're a love slave of Jesus Christ. For 490 years she failed to observe the sabbatical year and for 70 years she was a captive nation. God's going to have his Sabbath or his Lord's Day. Amen. She lamented her sad plight, said, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept when we, remember, when we remembered Zion. And I thought about it, and I guess we did start at 7 o'clock, so um, I didn't even look at my wife, but I did look at the clock, and I should be finished. But if you'll stick with me a little bit longer, I, I was thinking about it as I thought about this truth, and all the, all the, all the saints of God, all the... The holy men of God who have graced this platform and the people that have been on these grounds and somebody told us since we're here said why you used to hear them praying behind the trees you used to hear them praying everywhere around thank God for the praying we've heard and had the privilege of joining in and so on but my friends we need to get back to the old paths and the old time glory and the old time fire that we used to have praise the Lord hallelujah I'll never forget when I was a new Christian in Ontario Canada the place where I was staying uh, they took me a Sunday afternoon to the holiness camp meeting I'd never been to one in my life before just a young fellow I was saved when I was 14 and a half years of age and uh, I was a little older than that but not long after I was saved they took me to the holiness camp meeting and that's before they compromised in that area that's before they turned liberal in that area that's before they started a lady started to fuzz up their hair and and people started going to the, the skating rinks or the bowling alleys that's before they started doing a lot of those things they had the glory on them and you could feel God over the place praise the Lord when I left there as a young convert a young Christian I said that's what I want Amen. What do you need to entertain your young people? The Holy Ghost upon us. The glory on us. The Holy Ghost back on us. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise His name. I may not be dotting every I and crossing every T tonight, but I'll tell you, I feel something on the inside. Praise the Lord. Uh, that you don't get out of books uh, and that you don't get to, uh, through learning how to do it. Uh, but thank God, I'm glad there is. Uh, uh, thank God, uh, the glory of the Lord that satisfies the heart of every individual who will open to them. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise His name. Joshua and Caleb uh, gave uh, the minority report um, and the opposition would have stoned them. But the glory came down and overshadowed them. I don't mind being in the minority as long as I can have the glory. Do you? Amen. Kind of encourages me to remember that I think it was 30,000, wasn't it? 38,000 that Gideon started out with them. But he ended up with 300 uh, that weren't fearful and afraid and that, uh, uh, you know, that lapped up the water from their hand instead of uh, down. You know, they could watch and, and be faithful that way uh, and drink the water. Uh, praise the Lord. Well, God wanted the glory. They w might have said we did it, but they depended on God and 300 did more. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Allegheny may be small in comparison to a lot to, of different denominations, but thank God, my friend, that we have a glory and a power and a presence that others uh, are, uh, are absent from others. My friend, we can do much, much more, and it'll be lasting. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise His name. Well, this glory affords a unity of the Spirit. You know, there's one thing about it to when after the elections are over in the local church or the conference and so on, we abide by what the majority rules, don't we? And everybody said amen. No, they didn't. But anyway, I believe this weather, as long as it doesn't amount to compromise and caving in for the devil, I believe, my friend, if we weren't in favor of it, I say this and I've said this, then I believe we'll give an extra $5 for the project and we'll help out on Saturdays or our day off with it. Praise the Lord. Just to show a right spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank God. Our prayer is show me thy glory. Show me thy glory. Show me thy way. Thank God. We know the way, don't we? Thank God what we need now is the glory on the way and on our hearts. 
This glory incites our aspirations and endues our spirit. This glory will make you equal for life's problems and opportunities. Words can hardly describe the glory. But I pray with Moses, show me thy glory. In Deuteronomy 7 and part of chapter 8, Moses exhorts to obedience. We're going to have to be obedient. You won't have much of the glory if you're not being obedient. Chapter 9 and 1, hear, O Israel, pass over. Moses rehearses their rebellion, their idolatry. And chapter 10, he tells of God's mercy. And now, Israel, verse 12, and now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. And we read in Isaiah 55, 11, and we sing it sometimes, Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion and everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Denneker, the great German sculptor, spent eight years carving out of the cold marble the face of the Son of God. When he finished, he unveiled it. And those who saw through their tears, they said, How great! Italy heard of his work and sent an embassy to ask him uh, to make a statue of their goddess Venus. But turning to them with all the righteous indignation of his German soul, Daniker said, Sirs, do you think that after I have looked for eight years upon the face of the Son of God, that I can now turn my attention to that of a heathen goddess? He refused, and so must we refuse to turn from God to a cold religion and to idols. I say this tonight, and I believe it's true. I don't see, see how anybody can ever be satisfied once they have tasted of the good the things of God and felt the glory and sensed His presence. I don't see how we can ever expect to be satisfied with anything less than going on and getting more of the glory of God. Amen. Well, it's sad to say, but the rich, prosperous, wise reign of King Solomon was followed by apostasy, idolatry, under wicked, the wicked King Rehoboam. As the account is given in 1 Kings 14, 25 through 27, Shishak, a type of the devil, of course, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem and took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He even took away all. And he took away all the shields of gold which Solomon had made. And King Rehoboam in their stead gave them brazen, made brazen shields, or shields of brass. Shishak had taken away the shields of gold, and to cover up for their embarrassment, Rehoboam substituted shields of brass for shields of gold. And I'll tell you, my friend, when we try to make up and substitute for the blessed Holy Ghost, it sounds pretty brassy and pretty empty. It's a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal, to use the expression of the Scripture. But Satan steals the shields of gold, the glory from the church, and she tries to cover up with a brassy substitute. The great preachers, prophets, and reformers in church history were men whom God raised up like Luther, John Knox, Wesley, Fox, Moody, and others to restore to the church the shields of gold. While time-serving, listen to this, while time-serving churchmen rested at ease in Zion and lukewarm professors of religion saw nothing, quote, saw nothing to be excited about uh, these, uh, uh, these, unquote, these godly seers were not to be deceived. They saw through these uh, men of God, holy men of God, they saw uh, through the sham, they saw beyond the veneer and false pretense and vain show and they saw the church was merely waving shields of brass trying to cover up for her loss of glory. These revivalists refused to be satisfied with less than God's best and so stirred the church until she had recovered her lost glory. And that's the way we're going to get it, my friends. Thomas Aquinas, an old statement incident, visited Rome and the Pope was showing him through the papal treasures and the pot of remark, you'll have to observe, the church no longer has to say silver and gold, have I none? But Aquinas answered, neither can she say, rise up and walk. Yeah. In other words, the glory is not there. 
far as Aquinas was concerned. The church is like Samson of old. She may have her hair, her hair cut and curled and colored. That's one thing I added to this message. Colored. And a ring on her finger. I added that too. She may look more stylish and not so different and not so outstanding when she goes down to the dime store. You know, you'd be surprised the dime store, uh, so-called dime store dress that some people wear, you know. When they're with the worldly crowd, they'll roll them up. And when they're with the holiness crowd, they'll roll them down. And they, when they're rolled down, they're not long enough. In my thinking, at least. Amen. 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 Well, I started to say the church is like Samson. She may have her hair cut and curled and colored and a ring on her finger. She may look more stylish and not to, too different from the world, but she has been shorn of her power and her glory. She may go out a couple of times a week and maybe once through the week a couple of times on Sunday and shake herself as at other times, but nobody else has moved. Amen. Amen. Why? We've lost the glory to a large extent. We need to get it back. Amen. In August, and I'm about finished, in August 1903, Evan Roberts with a few others entered into a solemn covenant that he would spend a whole day each month in prayer for a revival of God's work in Wales. He kept his pledge and within two years, one of the mightiest revivals of all history swept Wales and its influence has been felt around the world. Thank God all over this whole world. Praise his name. Amen. Let God's people put him to the test and let us appropriate his promises and meet the conditions and the glory will fall. Hallelujah. Amen. I've heard of individuals, they've had whirlings to come into the revival meeting and they would have hoped that so-and-so, dear old sister so-and-so, wouldn't have a glory spell and shout and run and so on uh, and uh, but lo and behold that happened and so the pastor called at that lady's home uh, sometime later and said well how did you he was almost afraid to ask how she enjoyed the service uh, well she said you know she said when that lady got up and shouted and got blessed she said that really did me good she said that was the cap sheep of the service so you see my friend uh, uh, the things that sometimes people are nervous about for other people, it really is unfounded. Thank God. And if we can get any of the worldly crowd into the holiness church, into the revival, into the camp meeting, into the service, they're not wanting to hear some dead, dry, stuffy old something, but they're wanting to have and hear something that has the glory on it and the Spirit of God on it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Well... I've heard it said, where is, and it's a scripture and I preach from those scripture texts as God directs, but we read, where is the Lord God of Elijah? I've heard people say that and say it and say it and, and I say it, but my friend, I'd like to ask tonight, where are God's Elijahs? Where are the people that are going to stand in the gap and make up the hedge? Amen. Amen. Thank God. It thrills me to think that God has left himself wide open. You can read it for yourself many times throughout the scripture. God leaves himself wide open for somebody to stand in the gap and make up the hedge. Somebody to intervene, somebody to intercede. If it hadn't been for a Moses and an Abraham and some of the other faithfuls, why, we'd have a different story written in these scriptures. But there was a Moses who interceded. Praise the Lord. When he came down, you can read it just in the previous chapter of where I read our scripture and our text tonight. You can read about it where Moses came down from the mountain. There they had made them the golden cap and so on. And you can read there also uh, that where Moses pled with God to forbear and to forgive and so on. And he said, if not, he said, blot my name out of the book which thou hast written. It's there. And you read another scripture following that. The Lord said the words of this effect, those who committed sin... Of those, uh, they shall be put down or destroyed. Those who have transgressed, those who have turned. Amen. If we'll turn to him, thank God there's mercy. I close with this brief illustration. We were, I think, in 1957. Uh, Sister Williams has been, her husband have been to that uh, church um, in Alney, Illinois, the city of white squirrels. And uh, we were there in a Pilgrim Holiness Church 
In 1957, in a revival meeting, though we were pastoring at Lexington, Illinois, but we were holding a revival meeting there. Sherman Dysher and his wife were pastors. Uh, the telephone rang in the parsonage uh, that one day, um, at one forenoon, uh, and it carried a sad message. Uh, his uh, sister's husband uh, in another town nine miles away uh, worked on trees, uh, had uh, fallen, and a lady, neighbor lady, looked out and saw this coat there on the sidewalks, thought it was just a, a coat that somebody had shed, uh, one of the workmen had shed. Um, but as she gazed, she could see somebody was in that coat. Uh, she called the police, and, and the emergency vehicle came screaming to the place, and they put that man on the stretcher face down, uh, took him to the emergency entrance of the hospital. Uh, Brother Sister Sherman Dysher went to visit him. They came back. Uh, we were around the kitchen table about 12.30, having a little lunch together when the telephone rang again with sadder news. He had fallen and he uh, was uh, seriously injured and they would like to have taken him to St. Louis, but specialists, uh, they knew he'd never stand the trip. Specialists said, you're going to have to turn him over. If he's going to live, he's going to have to be turned over. They turned him over and he died instantly. And his widow began to weep like her heart was breaking. No doubt it was almost breaking. And the doctor turned to her and said, it's better this way, for he would have been paralyzed from his shoulders down. She said, but doctor, he's lost. Doctor, he's lost. Brother Dyser told me, he said his sister had told him, said sometimes in the wee hours of the morning, she'd be awakened by her husband cursing, blaspheming Almighty God. She'd take a hold of his arm and shake him and plead, husband, please don't, please don't. But he'd pull his arm away and say, leave me alone and let me curse it out said sometimes it would be 3, 30, and 4 o'clock in the morning before he'd quieten down and drop off to sleep. This is the man the doctor said it's better this way for he would have been paralyzed from his shoulders down. But she said, doctor, he's lost. One by one, the doctors and nurses, they pulled the sheet over that dead form. They dropped their heads and filed out of that room of death. He's lost. He's lost. And I give that illustration to say, that my friends, it's either we go on and have the glory or we go back and be damned. I'm going to ask us tonight to, to turn in our songbooks to an old, old familiar hymn, 179, I believe it is. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Shall we stand together?